So hello everyone and welcome to today's virtual panel discussion from Reboot Aviation. So my name is Peter Jigalin. I'm business analyst at Asai Apron AI. I have over six years experience in aviation. I worked as check-in agent, as business aviation supervisor and as airline duty manager. I have experience uh, in both uh, ground handling and terminal operations. Uh, my current role uh, at Asaya uh, includes analysis of aviation related data generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, today, we'd like to discuss uh, whether 2020 is the last year for aviation or is actually an accelerator for innovation. Uh, before we get started, we'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know uh, how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit a question to today's presenters. Uh, to do so, just uh, type your uh, question into Q&A uh, at the bottom of the control panel. As time allows, uh, the panelists will address as many questions as they can uh, after they share their insights. Additionally, we will have a Q&A uh, session at the end of the virtual panel discussion. We will be recording uh, this, uh, this virtual panel discussion and we'll share the link uh, after the event. We kindly ask you to answer three short questions about the virtual panel discussion at the end. Um, as we are now done with housekeeping, uh, let's uh, let Jan William briefly introduce our Reboot Aviation initiative. Jan William, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, can you advance the slides? Um, yeah. So, yeah, go go on, please. So, Reboot Aviation, I don't want to spend a lot of time and, and, and uh, talk too much about our group, but, but it fits into the question uh, or the title of the virtual panel discussion. Uh, basically, our initiative was established in 2020, and it is a direct result of, of this crisis, of, 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 of the corona uh, pandemic, because we, in March and April, there were a couple of, of young companies, startups, primarily from the aviation tech uh, scene, that kind of ask themselves, okay, what can we do to help the industry? Uh, what, what needs to be done? And we all came to the conclusion that in order to recover from that year, from 2020, the aviation industry must be restarted. And, and as we are all from the tech industry, we said, okay, it must be rebooted. And there is no more excuse for not having a, a technology-driven innovation uh, and, it, and this kind of innovation in our mindset will basically be the key driver to achieve uh, the rebooting of this industry. Um, so that's basically why we got together. We, we, we started this initiative, hashtag Reboot Aviation. And the goal is to have joint efforts to educate the industry about what kind of technology is out there in the market, what is currently state of the art, um, and also how, if you combine all of these kind of technologies and look at the different processes, how we can bring this industry onto a new level. Um, so in 2020, we did, uh, I think, six or seven webinars so far. And then in December, we said, okay, having another webinar is maybe just having another webinar, but why not have a, a panel discussion with some of our partners to really uh, wrap this year up and see, okay, was 2020 really as bad or was it only bad? Let's say it this way, was it only bad or was it also some kind of accelerator for innovation in the aviation industry? Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is just a brief overview of all the partners we have. Um, some of them you will see later on in the introduction. Um, and, and, and with these partners, we will also continue next year to, to try and reboot the aviation industry. So then if we go to the introduction slides, I'll uh, hand it over to Andreas from Amorph. Hi, everybody. Uh, nice to be here. And uh, my, as already introduced, I'm Andreas uh, from Amorph Systems. Uh, I'm responsible at Amorph for business development uh, topics. And Amorph itself is a software supplier, and we are looking at forecasting, simulating, uh, operating uh, terminal operations at airports. 
um, and uh, yeah, deliver software solutions to help our clients uh, also in, in that challenging time. Thank you, Andreas. Rico, please. Yes, uh, my name is Rico Barendun, based in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. Um, I bring uh, more than 20 years of aviation industry expertise, uh, having started uh, delivering newspapers to aircrafts on the tarmac, which was a very interesting job. Um, having been commercial pilot on Airbus 320 and uh, then on ground handling aviation security and the last 15 years uh, doing e-services. Right now, looking at strategy and uh, product at uh, Elenium, uh, an Australia-based uh, company in Melbourne, a uh, five-year-old startup focused on innovations in passenger processing and freight uh, handling, uh, bringing the latest technologies and software as a services uh, to the industry. Thank you so much, Rico. Ali, you're welcome. Hi, my name is Lee Spencer. I'm the founder of a uh... Uh, start up called Uchu, and we've, I've been working in aviation for about 30 years in engineering, IT, construction, and this goes on. Uh, with Uchu, we specialize in mobility, remote operations, and automation, using data fusion and seamless visualization of devices. We provide advanced digital tools to free your business to work smarter. Feel free to reach out if you've got any ideas or want to discuss anything after this. Thank you. Enjoy the panel. Thank you so much, Lee. Natalie, please. Hi, my name is Natalie LeRoy. I'm a product manager and designer at Signal, um, a platform based in aviation in London. I'm probably uh, have the least amount of experience in aviation. I've been working in aviation for about three years um, and we uh, have been designing uh, behavior change systems for any type of behavior within aviation. So basically we focus mostly on fuel saving behaviors and implementation of individual campaigns for better SOPs. Um, but we've extended this to maritime um, as well as other operations within aviation in the past couple of years. Thank you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. And William? Yes, hello everyone. So. Um actually forgot to introduce myself first, but uh, we'll do this now. So my name is Jan Willem. I'm the Director of Business Development at Asaya. Um, spend about, well, I spent my whole life in aviation uh, as a kid more on, on reading everything that has to do with civil aviation, uh, spending lots of times at airports, uh, but also studied uh, air transport management in Cranfield and for the last 10 years now working professionally in the industry. Um, also, this uh, pandemic will not change this. Uh, at Asaya, we use computer vision and couple it with artificial intelligence algorithms to, to, to basically automatically detect everything that goes around an aircraft on the um, airport apron. So everything around turnaround efficiency, safety, and compliance. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jan Willen. Vincent, you're welcome. So my name is Vincent. I'm the founder of Fox ATM, a small consultancy for air traffic management and air traffic control based in Frankfurt, Germany. The company is three years old now. And before that, I worked uh, with the German ATC DFS and with SkyGuide at the time, it was still called Swiss Control, uh, which means I have roughly 20 years of uh, air traffic management technology behind my belt. Thank you so much, Vincent. So without any further ado, we can jump into the first question that we have. Yes, that's the question. So was 2020 simply, uh, was 2020 simply a lost year for aviation or was it rather an accelerator for innovation? Uh, this is the question to all our attendees and to our panelists too. Uh, Rico, maybe you can start. I think it's uh, really um, a year for innovation. Um, I think when you look at uh, what has happened, it has really forced the, the whole aviation industry to relook at, at how we do things. Uh, it has uh, created such a big uh, disaster and, and personal uh, disasters for, for many uh, 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 colleagues or so on and, and, and so on in, in the community. But I think it's, it's really a big driver for innovations. It's a big driver for collaboration as well. And, and I think the, the whole industry is going to 
come out of it, uh, uh, this whole thing much stronger. Okay, thank you, Rika. So what are, are the panelists' opinion about this? Natalie, what's your take on that? Um, and there was definitely a, a massive loss and, uh, loss and a lot of reshuffling. Um, however, we see acceleration of buying up of certain companies and some certain companies have sprinted forward like Southwest. Um, we also see a lot, of, a lot of innovation and things that would have been put off to other years being, being started now because there's been such a massive leap forward in using new technologies, touchless technologies, and also um, uh, types of uh, software that I don't think we would have seen otherwise. We, we really, um, in our business, I guess we saw people taking some time down and then also saying, give me more ideas. Tell me where you could take us. Where are we going? What are we going to do in the future? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Lee, uh, what do you think about 2020? Lee, we can't hear you. Probably anyone else from our panelists would like to yeah, comment yeah. on that. I would actually like to, to um, continue where or, or, or join where Natalie uh, said that 2020 was definitely a year, I guess, if you ask people working for airports, airlines and ground handlers, they, they will say it is the annus horribilis of the industry and, and probably the worst that we've ever seen. Uh, and, and on a personal level for, for several people in the industry, I think that is more, more than true. But on another, when we look at the, at the wider industry level, I guess what Natalie said, we have seen a tremendous drive um, for innovation. Maybe not yet um, companies in the industry adopting that innovation, but, but at least there was a necessity to think and act quickly. Um, and as you said, you have uh, your likes of Southwest, you have the likes of Wizz Air that are completely um, uh, thriving in, in this, in this uh, year. Um, and I just spoke today with uh, a dear colleague or an old colleague of mine. And he said that, that basically he's also working for a software company in the aviation domain. And he said that he never had such a a possibility to, to move forward product development than in this one year. Uh, and, and, and that really like brought the whole product and then the, the, the company forward. So I think it's, it's a bit of a, of a mixed bag. Yes, there are probably thousands and thousands of personal uh, stories that will say that 2020 was a completely horrible year. But I think from an industry perspective, when we look back five or 10 years, it will probably be the starting point of a, what will be a completely different industry in the years to come. Absolutely. And I see that most of our attendees agree with you. So 73% think that 2020 is an accelerator for innovation. Uh, Andreas, maybe you want to drop a comment on that? Yeah, so I, I can just agree, actually, yeah, despite that this year was definitely a, a hard year yeah, for, for the entire industry. I, I see it actually the same. And what was interesting for, for me and also for us as a, as a company is actually that a lot of topics um, were, let's say, put a finger on due to that crisis that have been problems before. But maybe before Corona, we had that kind of, of luxury ignoring them, yeah? uh, collaboration between airlines, airports um, was already in, in people's minds, but now I think there are some, some topics that will force us and that crisis will force us to act much quicker and, and come up with innovations to react and, and basically pick up also these topics uh, that we've already seen before Corona uh, of, of being an issue, but now there's no way around them anymore. So that, that was somehow the, the, uh, what we've seen as, as, a, as a result of that year. Cool, thank you. Jan Willem, do we have a question from the floor? Yes, and I think um, that is maybe something for, for Natalie. Um, 
It comes from Mina Abadir. Uh, what collaboration examples can you provide that you were involved with outside of your particular niche expertise? Sure. Um, so I received a couple of requests to work with um, extended operations, perhaps in ground handling as well as in turnaround. So getting every part of the turnaround process from ground handling to uh, in-flight crew check-in fuel aligned, right, to get out uh, on, on exactly on time to coordinate better with other terminals, but also to make sure that there's no money lost in any minute, right? I think what we're going to see is that pieces of operations that may have been ignored because they wouldn't have yielded enough ROI are going to be honed in on and that marginal gains will become ever thinner and that every, every chance to save money will be more important. Um, beyond that, we've also looked into other, other forms of collaboration and that's perhaps checking on wellness and checking in on how people are doing with the heavy circumstances that they've been handled, handed um, in this past year. Um, and because of some of the excitement around this and application beyond aviation, we've been looking at other industries that um, are not quite uh, in the realm of aviation, but have had similar challenges like shipping. Okay, thank you so much, Natalie. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we'd like to discuss uh, how um, we'd like to discuss how did 2020 affect air traffic control, air traffic management, and flight operations. Uh, here we have Vincent uh, from Fox ATM, Vincent Lambert. Here, please, Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan Willem. Um, the biggest change. The thing that occurred for, for air traffic management was uh, basically a 180 degree turn. Air traffic management is an industry that has been here for decades to first create capacity and then manage a demand that is over the capacity. So basically, until now, we always had more flights that we could accommodate. And the whole industry was built up to, to manage that over demand. And all of a sudden, we are in the completely opposite situation where we have much more capacity than demand. Um, and, and that required a lot of adaptation. You probably remember in March and April, we have seen even general audience media articles on airlines operating empty flights just to keep uh, their slots, so the right to operate at certain airports. Because that mechanism was here to manage the overcapacity, and all of a sudden, it became something that forced airlines to operate flights that were economically and environmentally and not making any sense. And, and luckily the industry adapted quite quickly and these rules have been waived for um, at least uh, a few months. And you can also see reports from Eurocontrol where they say, look, uh, every route over Europe is now 8% shorter. And it's not because it would not have been possible and it would not have been possible before but because we have so less flights, we can optimize a lot of things. So the industry really changed from always being at the edge of the available capacity to managing a, a much smaller demand. And that was, that was one change. The other thing is um, we had to manage and, and find a way to keep air traffic controllers skills sharp and, and current. As you know, air traffic controllers have licenses just like pilots and they have to work a certain number of hours on different parts of the airspace to keep their license valid. And the question is, how do you keep these licenses and these skills valid when you have much less traffic? It means when sectors are closed, so you have much less controllers working, you are still paying them and you don't want to lay them off because air traffic controllers are highly specialized and very long to train. The training takes up to four years, so you don't want to, to follow or, or fire your air traffic controllers, but you have to keep them sharp. And the same thing is applying to the training pipeline. When you have a trainee, which is a few weeks or a few months before its qualification, it did cost a lot of money to train him, to find him, to bring him up to speed. And then you need the traffic to finish the training and, and validate them. And one move that we've seen uh, is that simulation took a much more important role. Simulation is always used in air traffic control. Um, 
but now some ANSPs like VSNA in France even uses simulators to validate licenses. And this is something that has been in the air if you speak with the training department for long. But the regulator were always thinking hmm, simulation, it's not like the real deal, it's good, but it's different. Uh, and now mm -hmm. it's possible and it has been approved because it was a must. And if you look at the very specific case of the SNA, it's not a temporary thing. It is really a change of the training manuals, the training procedures. So it is something that will last for more than just COVID. And I think that will be one of the questions tonight to see how much of the changes we see now are just to survive COVID and will vanish afterwards and how much of them will remain for the longer term. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Vincent, I think you already triggered <laughs> some interest. <laughs> Uh, there's actually uh, one question from Rebecca Meldrum. Um, do you think that the 8% shorter will remain as a normal level or no, will remain as normal levels return? Or are these temporary improvements? Um, what do you think? That, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for that, Rebecca. It, you have to look at it in a broader scope of what we call free root airspace, which is basically saying you enter a controlled area at a point and you can go from here direct to every other point. You do not have to follow pre-published routes. And this is something that has been implemented and has been in roll out over Europe before COVID happened. And that's helped already a lot to shorten the route. Now, it's easier for pilots to always get direct routes, but it's much more complicated for air traffic controllers. The point is when you have a network of routes you know where conflicts can happen. Conflicts can happen where you have crossings, but nowhere else. When you have everybody flying direct routes, conflict can occur anywhere. And the management and the, the lookout for conflict is much more complex and requires actually technical tools for that. Now, you can do much shorter routes for now in some airspaces which are less congested because you have less conflicts and less traffic. So I guess in some margin, uh, the route has been adapted, the route network has been adapted, and it will be adapted again when capacity and, and demand comes back. Mm -hmm. But there will probably still be some bottlenecks that will survive. Uh, in preparing that webinar, we discussed about pilots uh, not getting holding patterns when flying into, into London Heathrow, for example, which is unusual for now. But <laughs> when the demand will come back, these kind of things will come back again because the capacity will not be that much extended. There will certainly be improvements thanks to the, the reviews and the deep redesign of some elements, but major structural bottlenecks will probably still be there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vincent. Very interesting point, especially on ATC, ATC professionals and how the training goes now. That's fantastic. Um, thank you once again. Natalie, uh, the floor is yours, um, please. Uh, we can discuss flight operations now. Um, sure. So uh, throughout my time with Signal, I've seen companies that are always curious um, about campaigning for change using scientific, me me scientific methods. But in 2020, we're definitely starting to see that companies are looking to, to enlist the help of psychology and nudging to cut waste wherever possible. And that from pilot to dispatch to operations and on the ground. Um, and Technologies that are low barrier to entry and low cost are going to become um, paramount to starting to, to alleviate some of those marginal, marginal gains. Um, Aviation's laid off tens of thousands of employees right now. And IATA is predicting a four, um, 400,000 um, billion loss or half of 20, 2019's earnings. Um, so there's just been more discussion, and in addition, there's been more discussion on how to regulate airlines um, to bring them to net zero or reduced carbon. Regulation and taxing um, are becoming standard speak in marketing and PR and operations in, in response of gearing up for some of that. And so if you could go to the next slide. Um, we're seeing that uh, airlines are asking for behavioral change beyond flights and then other silos like flight planning and dispatch, um, making sure that all uh, that a, an operation begins with an efficient uh, 
efficient standard, as well as into cargo and, and private airlines. We, for the first time, we've been approached by individual charters, as well as um, groups that are concerned with the amount, the uptick in private flying that they've been able to do and um, bringing their operations to something that's more sustainable. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and then we've gotten a lot of requests for uh, behavior change across whole processes, like I had mentioned earlier. So every part of a turnaround process being coordinated from ground handling, crew, cleaning, and fuel to be something that is um, dialed into the, the second, the minute, in order to um, enable for the least amount of fuel to be burned and the least amount of energy to be taken up. Um, and also uh, being able to take all of that data and information and review it with several different terminals so that they can share that information with not just one airline, but multiple, multiple others to learn from it. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, and in addition, I think one thing that's been nice to consider about this as well is that 2020 has been stressful for everyone. So reviewing how to get feedback from all employees across all different positions, checking in on how passengers are affected and gathering their feedback on how they've been handled and how um, the process has been working has been really important. Um, and it's been brought up in multiple different ways about how to conduct surveys and how to understand exactly what employees are, are saying qualitatively rather than just the data. Um, and, and keeping them engaged and involved. I, um, some of the pilots that we've been working with as far as advisors have actually left for different careers out of um, concern of what's going to happen in the industry. And then um, others are being coached by different airlines. And so airlines want to dial in and see what, what their employees are actually thinking about and um, using a softer touch tool or something that isn't necessarily uh, uh, just so removed from people, right? is I think is going to be important and in considering that I think that there will be some some changes in to making this a, a bit of a healthier industry a bit of a an industry that's focused on keeping an individual and their training in the future okay Natalie Vincent thank okay. you so much Jan William do we have uh, questions mm -hmm. from the floor for Vincent yes. and Natalie great we actually, we actually have uh, very interesting questions what I would like to do is, uh, Yusuf, you, you asked a very interesting question. We will come back to this topic later on. So I would like to, to just park it for the moment. Uh, um, okay. um, uh, I will definitely get back to you, Yusuf, on, on your question. Uh, Sugandhi um, the, and, and Daniel. Uh, so Sugandhi uh, Jayaraman asked, how do you think airports and airlines are going to buy into investing in innovation and digitization, considering that they already have shrinking revenues and, and lower demand owing to the pandemic? And the same or a similar question was actually asked by Daniel Stecher, a dear friend of mine from, from IBS. Which airlines, and, and sorry, I, ha I have to, 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 to grim at, at, at this question, which airlines are really making use of the low traffic times in order to go and start the necessary business transformation projects and really digitize airline operations processes in the operations control center? Which airline did this since March? I'm only hearing hectic times and survival mode and all the experts are furloughed and not available to run the transformation projects. Um, so both of you, thanks a lot for this super interesting questions. Um, and I think uh, Sugandhi, you, 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 you phrased it a bit nicer, but Daniel, you basically uh, hit the nail on the head. And before I share my opinion on this, anyone from the panel that, that, that has an opinion and that wants to share their experiences over this year, do you have an airline that actually bought your, your product or that actually used your company to digitize and innovate. I think I, I would like to, to quickly jump in here. Uh, it's uh, part of the discussion that uh, we're going to have as well uh, shortly about the passenger growth. Uh, I think the the big challenge is not right now. Right now, everybody's in survival mode, but uh, it's in preparation for uh, when the passengers are coming back. And uh, I think there is the big question is how long can the airlines and airports wait uh, to prepare to get back to Kind of the normality and uh, put the new solutions in and uh, my personal opinion is that uh, a lot of airlines and airports will simply be driven to 
uh, have innovative solutions for, for various reasons. Uh, uh, lack of, of staff, uh, a short term, uh, getting them back, um, uh, and so on. So I think it's it's going to be a necessity. Uh, um, just imagine having a vaccine coming up uh, and uh, suddenly uh, for summer, no more problems in, in flying. To see a, a huge boost in, in in passengers wanting to travel, and I think that's that's really rare. Uh, then everybody will have to just do something, and probably innovation is going to be and, and new technologies. Uh, a lot of companies, uh, suppliers are ready to do it, and, and I think everybody will jump in and and help and support uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree, and yeah. and I think also uh, Sugandi to come back to your question specifically. Um, I think there will be an unintuitive truth, and, and we will come back to this a little bit later, but it's, it's in my opinion, it's not so much about how or, or, or if airlines and airports will invest in it because they, they have lower revenues, but because they have lower revenues, I strongly believe there is no other choice than invest, uh, investing into digitization. Um, connecting this with Daniel's comment, Honestly, I, I, I feel the same way. I have not seen any investment um, that was not already signed 2019 or 2018 and just installed or, <clears throat> or rolled out this year. And then there was a, a press release about it. Um, I think, but, but, but I think 2020 did one thing to the industry. Yes, it was still not bold enough or there, there, there were very few, let's say there were very few players that were bold enough to actually invest and, and, and take this opportunity. There's a very nice McKinsey study that, that actually shows that those companies that invest in the downturn, that invest right into innovation in the middle of the crisis, are among the best performers when it comes to return on investment and, and shareholder value uh, five to 10 years after the crisis. But I think what 2020 did is that it pushed innovation, digitization, less redundant, uh, 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 less um, 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 relation to, to manual processes, much more into the focus. And I guess if we now go into the next um, bit where we speak about how the whole year 2020 changed airport operations uh, and later on also also apron operations we will see even more that there are certain pockets where where innovation really or where where the pandemic drove innovation and also drove investment in innovation but i guess we will come back to your questions throughout the whole kind of of panel discussion so thanks a lot really good questions yeah and we have one follow-up question also from daniel and one from yeah. Wahid. Maybe I, I can I can comment a bit also on, on that based on, on our experience because uh, we've seen exactly what Daniel has described. Um, a lot of organizations, especially bigger organizations, airlines, airports have somehow a bit stuck in that progress of let's say just focusing on their own and, and how to reduce costs. And they lost a bit, let's say the, the track on how to innovate and how to get uh, back into an, an, a mode of looking forward. And I think in my belief, it's quarter to 12, actually. Yeah, they really need to, to use that time that we have right now to bring those innovations into place because that reboot will happen at some time. And when this happens without innovating now, this, this could hit even more and even harder than this crisis already did. So I think it's, it's really the best time now to, to move ahead. And I think that somehow is also the, uh, in, in like Daniel's comment, um, we are now in, in the position to do so. We, we've never ha had that low traffic. So now we have the, the best opportunity actually to do that kind of change because when traffic is back, everybody will argue, okay, we can't make this IT change or that dig digital change because um, of the operational consequences. Now there is the time to do and we should use it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the timing, the timing thing is, is is one of the challenges here is no one knows when when the vaccines are going to be at a level where traffic's going to start to come back and when governments are going to start relaxing quarantine periods. So there's there's that as well. And I think we've seen some airports have run some of the capital programs. Like, you know they've used this opportunity to resurface runways and do some of the things that are really difficult to do when uh, when we're really busy. And, and many airports and airlines were probably focusing on how do they manage very congested airfields or very um, 
or times when it's particularly busy. And actually the model is now changing and it's not so much a, how do we manage it to be really busy, it's how do we manage this ramp up? And the, and the, and the, the industry has never, um, never had anything like this. So they're not, they can't fall back on experience of people going, I remember this when. Yeah. And that's one and, of the challenges. And Daniel, maybe, although it, it, it might be a weak, a weak point, but at least it's a point. There's one thing that I, that I realized uh, where I was very, very uh, surprised. In my whole career, when I saw RFPs, uh, was always a request for a cloud-based installation. And then when you uh, answered the RFP and the IT team finally got into the game, then the cloud-based installation was very quickly uh, removed and, and exchanged for an on-prem installation due to data security and, and And yeah, they, they wanted to have everything on their side. And this year I've actually been very surprised because we had two projects where the customer actually said, no, 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 we want to do cloud-based installation because we want to reduce our financial kind of burden in the future and become much more flexible. As a, again, it's, it's, it's just a small part, but I think it, it, it shows a, an, a, some kind of development also in the thinking that digitization is not just making your operations more efficient and having some cool looking uh, new GUIs and using AI for whatever reason. But I think more and more people in the industry understand that digitization can help them to become much more flexible on a cost basis. So let's just keep fingers crossed that, that this will also continue in the next years. Regarding the other questions, I mean, we, we get so many good questions, we will come to all of them, but I would say some of them will also be answered throughout the, the next couple of minutes. So I would say let's, let's continue and then we will come step, step by step to the other questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Jan Will, and thank you, all panelists. So now we'd like to uh, discuss how did 2020 affect terminal operations. Here we have Andreas uh, from Amorph Systems and Rico from Millennium Automation. So, Andres, please, your, the floor is yours. Okay, so as we are, let's say, running close to the year's end, I, I, I thought it's maybe good to, to look back when everything was uh, normal yeah, and, and when that crisis started actually to evolve yeah, around February, March, when we've seen that downturn is going to happen. And um, at that point in time, I think a lot of us were curious about what is going to happen, what type of measures will come, how will processes change, um, what is actually needed to ensure um, yeah, back uh, passengers' confidence in flying? Because what we've seen is that a lot of people have lost actually that confidence during that, that time. And as we, from a an, from an, uh, company perspective, we've looked into different technologies, thermal cameras and whatever is available there and, and was hyped uh, also for a couple of weeks and then dropped again. Um, for us, it was really interesting to see, okay, how that uh, different measures that were, let's say, discussed were brought in place and um, some of them actually, as said, were, were dropped and others were followed. Yeah? And I think within, yeah, let's say, going a, a couple of weeks, months further, we've seen then um, the, the measures actually that uh, were, let's say, yeah, applied like social distancing, um, yeah, wearing face masks and, and all the sanitization efforts that airports have done. Um, and this created a huge impact actually on the existing capacity. So if you look at uh, checkpoints, waiting areas, um, and the whole efficiency of the, of the processes, actually that there was a, a big impact uh, on those and uh, still, uh, let's say, very volatile um, how the, these uh, measures needed to be applied yeah i think there was a um, we never had actually that situation um of all, almost daily changing uh measures and, and parameters that we need to adapt to yeah? and and for us it was i think it was a very that was helpful also to to um get that feedback also from our customers to see uh what are they looking for and what kind of scenarios are they planning uh airports that looked into how does that impact also my my capacity at all yeah? and, and how would that reboot happen if I still need to have those measures in place? I think this was one of the major questions that we were asked to help, um, especially uh, in, in the airport domain, uh, to see, okay, what is, what is the, what will the future will be 
uh, with growing numbers again and uh, these measures in place. So all around what we, let's say, saw is the predictability actually what, let's say, was a bit um, smashed down. Yeah, All the predictive systems operating with historical information were somehow crashed. Uh, but um, it, with the right, let's say, approach, it was at least possible to restore that and to, to get uh, airports back at least in a term of uh, short-term, mid-term predictability to, to get back to, okay, what is going to happen in the next couple of weeks and what will happen if um, nationalities will bring up new measures. One of the, the, the major things that we've all seen, and, and I mean, this is like, like, a, like a common topic yeah, for all areas in, in the airport airline environment are these cost cuts. Um, but also the thinking in parallel, how to make business more resilient, more flexible for the future. And, and I think one of the great shifts that we will see is uh, from an IT perspective spoken, getting from ownership to service, software as a service will be much more, let's say the, the required um, way of purchasing software, for example, than um, owning a, the ownership of a, of a software license. This will completely shift. And I think this is also just it's, it's very clear yeah, that airports want to go that way uh, because uh, they need to reduce somehow the, the OPEX costs. So it's, it's just a clear way of um, how to move things forward and also how to bring companies back on board is um, adopting the commercial models towards the, the current situation. Great, thank you for your input, Andres. Uh, Andres will be able to answer your questions uh, after Rico is done with the terminal operations. So we have two panelists speaking about terminal operations. Uh, Rico, you're welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I've been really looking at the side of passion growth, uh, the challenges that we are in at the moment and how do we manage that with uh, anticipated passenger growth. So main challenges, and, and these are really unique that have come up with uh, the, the whole COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, we do uh, temperature checks now in different forms in different areas at the airport. There is uh, different airports doing uh, COVID-19 rapid testing. Uh, we have health passports coming up. We have requirements to, to have a, a test uh, shown, a proof of test. Uh, we'll have the vaccine uh, hopefully uh, coming uh, and being uh, uh, successful shortly. A lot of physical distancing at the airports and, and hygiene measures. Now, this just uh, creates issues at the airport with uh, terminal operations, with passenger flows and, and so on, uh, which is probably not a big deal with uh, the low numbers of passengers that we see right now. But uh, uh, what about passenger uh, numbers growing? Uh, we will see issues around capacity doing that. We'll see issues about space efficiency. Uh, accuracy of the different measures is always a, a something of concern. For example, temperature checking uh, being one of them. Uh, and trust, uh, trust, I mean, the health passports as well, uh, as well as having, uh, for example, um, uh, a certificate that you got the vaccine and so on. Uh, it's a big issue. We see that uh, there are um, uh, passengers already trying to fake uh, a certificate, trying to uh, make their way, which is natural when, uh, when you have uh, something like a test costing $100 or $200, which could be more than the flight ticket. Uh, people will try to cheat and, and will try to get around it. So these are kind of the challenges which really need uh, uh, new solutions, uh, which you can see on the right side. Uh, so we anticipate a lot more touchless processing which is something that has started before uh, COVID-19 already. Uh, also see different airlines and airports really pushing for biometrics approach, the IATA One ID uh, project as well. Um, I mentioned already the health passports uh, and triage processing. With triage processing, I mean, making sure that you can have efficiently uh, check different passenger groups to, to depending on the risk. Um, uh, Andrea's already talked about business intelligence before. My personal uh, belief as well is flight disruption solutions. Uh, I think the, the pandemic and uh, the start of the pandemic has shown that uh, there is a big weakness of flight disruption solutions automation. Uh, there's not big automation today with most of the airlines. And uh, I do see that a, a big um, uh, opportunity for airlines to, to invest in and uh, uh, make sure that there is automation behind disruption handling and so on. And in the end, it has been mentioned before, it's better collaborations between stakeholders. Uh, we have seen a lot of times airports, airlines, uh, uh, stakeholders fighting each other. 
I think right now we're all in the same uh, boat. We all uh, have a, a generic aviation issue, the industry issue, and uh, we just have to collaborate. Uh, next slide, please. So I would like to, to just show you very briefly in regards of uh, something from outside of aviation. Uh, in Elenium, we have actually decided to move outside of aviation at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, just in order to, to, to make sure that we, uh, we survived the pandemic uh, as well. We have already been working on, on different touchless solutions, uh, more focused on passenger with reduced mobility uh, and usability uh, for the interfaces. Uh, and at the start of the pandemic, we have decided to uh, enhance the, the touchless solutions with vital sign detection, which is now being used in, in different areas, in hospitals, in uh, uh, sports uh, um, uh, events, uh, in elderly care facilities, at workplaces and so on, just to do a screening of, of passengers, or not passengers, workers and, and visitors and so on going in. And just, uh, can you start the video, please? So just to quickly show you how easily this is, how easily this can be done, is really purely touchless. Uh, basically, the person controls the screen with uh, moving the head, uh, just selecting what uh, they, they want to select, uh, doing a quick check of the vital signs. Basically, this is done every morning at um, uh, uh, different uh, workers' place, so a factory or so on, before somebody can go in or somebody can go into an office. And we also see that these solutions are not purely for COVID-19. These are, are here to stay. Uh, the companies deploying these sort of solutions are thinking ahead, uh, saying, well, what can we do in, in the next uh, um, uh, pandemic? What can we do to reduce the sick days for infectious diseases anyway? Uh, and that's these are the sort of things that, uh, that we're seeing going forward. And I think um, uh, looking at a couple of questions that also came up, I think there is a need to innovate. I think we, we will, the, as, as an industry, go into uh, tremendous trouble uh, with ramping up uh, with the limited amount of staff that, that will, may be available, that uh, may be available to be called back. Uh, and uh, innovations are, are simply going to be required. Technologies are there. And I think there are also going to be new business models uh, going forward that uh, are looking at a potentially not big uh, uh, investment uh, uh, possibilities around the upfront cash payment, but it's really more going to be about uh, can we do per use, can we do uh, something around renting, can we uh, do more, uh, and Jan Villa mentioned it, software as a service, cloud deployment, in, instead of having big uh, uh, capital expenditure for uh, on-site deployments and so on. I think there are a lot of things that are, can really help. Okay, thank you, Rico. Thank you so much. You covered so many things about terminal operations. Jan Willem, do we have uh, any questions from the floor to Andreas or Rico? Um, not particular um, then I, to uh, them, but, uh -huh. oh, wait, 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 easy. <laughs> um, but, but actually, uh, Andreas, Rico, I, I have one question um, that, that came up while, while listening to you. Now, I can imagine that airports being at the forefront of, of passenger touch points or being the first kind of guard of passenger touch points. Uh, Rico, especially on your side, have you seen, to come back to, Chris, uh, to Daniel's question as well, have you seen some investments that were actually agreed on or, or new contracts that were agreed on in 2020 during the pandemic regarding touchless travel? Um, I, I, we have seen uh, airports investing. We have seen uh, some of our customers also continuing to invest, uh, anticipating the growth. So we have uh, uh, customers of ours just continuing on, not slowing down, uh, really saying, well, we're confident that the passenger numbers are coming back. So there's really no reason of, of stopping now. Uh, and I think we've also uh, all seen news or so on of different airports really taking the time uh, investing uh, into infrastructure, using kind of the downturn, uh, not uh, basically being able to, to do investments even into infrastructure, uh, not having to be to put big uh, hoarding walls up and uh, having to, to do um, uh, construction work during uh, peak passenger flow and so on. Um, and at the same time, I believe there is a lot of, of airports uh, and especially also airlines really looking at different technologies. Um, and as I said before, I think the struggle is, yes, uh, many of the people are furloughed, many, many of the people are, are not at work potentially, uh, but I think the, 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 it, it's still crucial. And I think uh, a lot of the airports and airlines understand that they need to, to be looking at what could there be next. And I think it's just 
managing kind of the, the right time to, 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 to really still be able to do something, uh, not be too late uh, versus uh, spending the, the money and, and uh, putting the people onto developing something early enough. And I think we, we will see quite a lot of development and quite a lot of movement in, in the coming uh, few months uh, as soon as we, we probably see the first kind of results of the, the vaccine programs, um, uh, airlines will probably become more confident and, and then push forward to really get ready for, for summer potentially. Great, Rico, there is uh, one question. Thank you so much. There is one question for Andreas. Uh, how can we, and it's connected with what you just, just have said, uh, how can we reconcile the need to, to innovate with the drastic reduction? in revenues being experienced by airports? Yes, I think this is a very valid question, yeah, because it, it's, it's the situation that we are currently in, yeah, to, to focus on innovations together, not only we as suppliers, but also together with our customers and, and the, the airports we are in touch with, looking at innovation and at the same time facing that uh, commercial issues um, the industry has. But I think, as already mentioned, yeah, it, it's, it's just it's the right time actually to look at it right now. Um, maybe it's even good to um, uh, take into assumption acceleration programs that are out there. I, I think I've seen a lot of airports actually joining these kind of programs to make sure that uh, somehow they are the right startups and SMEs um, picked up. Um, so not everyone is running in, into their doors. So this is maybe one of let's say how airports started to respond. Um, but I've seen also a lot of strategic work right now. So I, I, that's why I believe that 2021 can just get better because a lot of the work actually that is needed upfront on a, on a strategic level was pushed during the last uh, weeks and months to, to definitely define what are the next steps. Um, and, and then let's, let's hope for 21 to be also commercially viable or more viable to, to actually push these kind of innovations. I hope that answered the question. I, I would yeah. like to add quickly something to that. Uh, um, I, th I think we have to look back a couple of years as well. The last few years, I think, were so extremely easy for airlines and airports in, in uh, some areas of the world. Basically, you put a new plane out there, uh, you uh, increase your terminal space, and, and it was immediately filled. So there was really no, no big effort. Uh, it was just uh, going very smoothly. And I think when you, when you look at how normally uh, um, companies and so on, they have to invest into solutions before they can actually sell something. And I think right now we're, we're just in such a situation that there is a need for investment. Uh, yes, it's going to be challenging, but uh, I think the, the industry is still believing that uh, there is going to be a way upwards. We see uh, airlines being able to refinance the, their debt. We see airlines uh, being able to get uh, money from the, the market. Uh, so there is a belief uh, from investors as well that the aviation industry is going to survive and, and come, up, uh, come out very strong. And I think that that's just uh, which shows that the, the aviation industry is important. It's important to connect the world. It's, we see it right now. It's so important in regards to freight as well. It's, it's important to, uh, to just keep the economies everywhere going. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's, it's, it's just going to be natural that uh, um, these uh, dollars that flow into the uh, aviation industry are going to be used for innovations to make things uh, more efficient as well going forward. Okay. Uh, uh, Rico, I think Yep. Sorry, go ahead. Mate. Yeah, one, one, one last question for Rico. Yeah. So how can the staff be protected with growing passenger numbers? Important point, uh, because, you know, we have not only passengers, we have only staff, we want them to be healthy all the time. I think it's more on the Illinium side. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that, Rico? And mm -hmm. maybe, may, sorry, uh, if I, in, in connection with this, I would like to pick up a question that comes from uh, Nina Abadia and that goes a little bit in this direction. Um, if you, if you also think this in correlation, how do you bring initial touch points outside the airport location and into the home, uh, first given the lower manpower at airports? I, I think this is a very good question and, 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 and also relates very well to the question you asked, Piotr. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we will see a lot of drive for automation. We'll see a lot of push for uh, passengers to be more prepared. We'll also see uh, passengers are more conscious right now because there is uh, a bit of uncertainty where you can travel, how you can travel. 
So I think these sort of things are gonna gonna be pushed more out to the to the passengers anyway. So passengers are gonna be more prepared. They're gonna be more willing to actually check in uh, at home, uh, do whatever they can at home uh, or on a mobile device, and, and then really get fully prepared to the airport where they potentially just have to drop their the back and and move forward. Um, I really like the the Star Alliance uh, uh, initiative for biometrics uh, that that I've seen. Uh, it's it, it's not uh, we we haven't been involved just. Uh, uh, but, but I love the, the kind of uh, approaches on that, that they're doing it. And uh, I think it's, it's really something uh, that passengers can opt in. And I think this is going to be the, the future where you uh, opt into uh, an initiative for something that you can use across different airlines and, and you simply f- flow through the airport. In regards of, of staff, uh, there, um, and, and I've shown the uh, examples from outside of aviation, a lot of companies uh, take a lot of care of their staff. They have also seen that, uh, especially with infectious diseases spreading, uh, their operations can come to a stop very, very quickly. So I think uh, looking in the forward uh, in the future, both with staff, but also with passengers, is going to be very, very important that uh, um, all the aviation uh, companies are taking care of the, the, the health of the staff, of the, of the passengers as well, uh, and look at uh, uh, signs or so on what could, could be going on and uh, be ready to act uh, quicker than uh, what we've seen right now going from... Uh, 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 an epidemic in, in one country to a pandemic within uh, a matter of probably uh, three, four weeks. And, and I think this is this is something that uh, uh, people will need to be more prepared and uh, look at whatever they can in regards of being prepared for the next one. Cool. Great. I think we can also ask uh, Andreas just, one last question. Yeah, about yeah. what proactive... Just, just a small, uh, yep. small contribution to the staff topic because uh, I think one, one thing is the, the on-site... Um, yeah, let's say health and security issues, but what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, months, and that is due to the whole home office approach actually is that airports also start to think of how can we engage people also in an operational mode working from home. So if you look at pre-corona, everything was around AOCC, let's build a big operation center and put everyone in there. Uh, Now we see the opposite somehow. How can we bring actually teams virtually together um, and therefore you need technology. And it's, it, there's no way around uh, getting the information into let's say cloud enabled uh, environments and, and letting people join actually these platforms to enable them work together without being on site. Just one remark from my side. Yeah, Andreas, it perfectly answered my question. Good Thank one. you so much. Yeah. So now we'd like to move next and uh, discuss airside operations and the impact of 2020 on airside operations. So Jan William, the floor is yours. Thank you, Piotr. And, um, and here I will also um, come back to your question, Yusuf. Um, how do you think machine learning and artificial intelligence can help aviation to prevent losses from another pandemic in the future? Uh, I think that that's, that's actually one of the key questions everyone should ask himself or herself that is working in an airline or, or airport. Uh, maybe not so much about specifically machine learning and artificial intelligence, but in general, how can we use modern tech or state-of-the-art technology, uh, state-of-the-art ideas that, that, that come out also of other industries in order to really make the industry more resilient. And I called it Airset Ops 4.0 required on road to recovery. So what, what do we know as a fact um, has happened in, in 2020? So we lost highly trained and experienced staff on the apron in the terminal, but, but I'm right now looking at, at air set operations. So on the apron uh, with the ground handlers, with the airports, with, with every kind of stakeholder. Um, Natalie already touched on this a bit earlier and she said that she heard from pilots that actually went to a different industry um, because they didn't see a future in aviation. And the same will happen with, with, with this staff. Uh, oftentimes, um, not only working one job, but, but several jobs. So for them, it, it, it's not possible to wait for a year or two to, to regain or to, to re-enter into the industry. So that means that if we are looking at a quick recovery, um, that will not be possible without technological support. So here, also going a bit, a little bit to the question, um, 
why should airlines and airports like Sugandi into your question invest? In my opinion, there is no other possibility for them. 2020 was simply a year everyone had to kind of first understand what is happening. So there was the shock, the terror, uh, and then there was kind of simply survive. But I guess that we will see 2021 as um, a bit of, of recovery from this. And, and, and in order to restart operations, they will need technology. Um, Piotr, can you go back, please? Um, the, the, the next point is whoops, about the um, airside capacity. It's heavily reduced. So I spoke to a couple of airports. One of them told me that they actually closed down an entire terminal. Well, many airports closed down entire terminals, but they, what they actually did is they also did some, some construction there in order to have a COVID test facility in there. Um, so we realized, and, and we did also a little bit of research in this direction, that there's actually an unintuitive truth um, that there will be a capacity bottleneck next year at many airports uh, because flights will ramp up again. Uh, we've seen it in, in, in the summer period. Um, we have seen it from EasyJet that over Christmas and, and they saw that there were like 400, 500% uh, bookings that, that, that went through the roof. So we will not be at back at 100%, definitely not. We will probably not even be back at 90% on, a, on an industry-wide level. But we will have airports that were already very congested before um, that will very quickly reach a capacity constraint again because they cannot rebuild or reopen terminal space or, or, or aircraft stands uh, quickly enough. So there again, we will need technology to kind of make it possible for these airports and airlines to actually ramp up operations again. And then last but not least, um, and I think Rico, you, you touched on this, or Andreas, you touched on this earlier, many airports and airlines have tremendously high levels of debt accumulated during the crisis. So future financial recovery is only possible with, very low, with a very low cost basis. And I think that, that goes a little bit also into the question that, uh, who, who asked it? Um, sorry, yeah, there, there was one question from the audience earlier um, regarding low cost basis and flexibility, and also how we can make sure that we are more resilient as an industry uh, for future pandemics. And I think here, modern technology that is driven by, by artificial intelligence that is driven by data in general, um, that is driven by automation, will in the future, especially for airports, but also for airlines and ground handlers, reduce the, the fixed cost that you have that you cannot simply get rid of. Um, it will make it easier to, to actually ramp up and, and, and close down operations again. Uh, it will the, make the predictability better, even in, in, in times where your, your historic information is no longer really applicable. At the same time, however, I also have to say that from a supplier perspective, I think this crisis also was some kind of a drive for innovation when it comes to, to commercial uh, models, to pricing. Uh, Rico, you touched on this earlier there will be a necessity from a supplier perspective to also be a little more flexible and to do a, a, a per use based pricing and not just say, okay, it's an upfront payment and then that's it. So I think, I think here we, we, we see that in order to tackle the problems that, that have arisen this year, we need technology, especially the one that will help you to really manage a situation without any historic data to feed it. And that is normally what we do when we talk about artificial intelligence. Now that's a very wide focus. Machine learning, you also need historic information, but at least you can like always uh, gather new information day by day and, and, and improve the system than, than solely relying on, on, on data from last year. Like many planning scenarios for, for aircraft uh, um, stand planning or for 
for capacity planning, for staff planning is done with kind of, okay, what did we do last summer? And okay, let's, let's see how many more flights we have this summer. And then we come up with a new plan. And I think their artificial intelligence and machine learning driven uh, organizations will have a, a big, uh, a big um, improvement for the years to come. Very nice. Thank you, Jan William. We can already see implementation of uh, computer vision, artificial intelligence in many industries and aviation also picked up. So yeah, they're implementing the systems successfully. Thank you. Uh, so now we'd like to move uh, forward with the uh, road with the uh, air side operations and hear Lee uh, from Uchu Group. Lee, please, the floor is yours. Well, I think you know, we've touched on what a totally challenging and tough year this has been. Uh, totally unprecedented is a word that I've heard far too often. And I guess the, the outcome of much of this has come for companies are much leaner and many would have lost a lot of staff. And we've talked about that, not just operational staff, but a lot of back, back office staff as well. And we're beginning to think about, well, how will the companies manage to um, provide the service once we start to see an increase in traffic numbers and, and trying to sort of focus on what your staff um, numbers should be is really hard in this environment because we don't really know. You know if you're talking about taking people off a of furlough and trying to give people time to, to retrain uh, and, and, and redo certification is, is when's the best time to bring them back. Um, and the other example as well, which is something that, that traditionally when you have like unplanned operational events, uh, like weather, system failures, industrial disputes and so on, companies would be able to throw people at the problem. They would get some people from the back offices to help. And you know, this may not be something that can, that can happen in, in the future because the staff are just not there. Um, so, so I mean, what are the options? Well, do we think that that companies will just rehire all of the people that have been made redundant and have left the businesses um, in the future? Uh, we don't think so. Uh, we might also see more outsourcing, but that's not really innovation. We've been doing outsourcing for years and sometimes it works well and sometimes less so. Um, we also expect to see a uh, fast forward in the adoption of robotics and autonomy as well. So. Now, we've already seen remote control autonomous tugs uh, being trialed. Well, we've also seen cleaning robots and uh, an automated PRM equipment. You know, we'll see more of this happen because uh, firstly, potentially uh, is COVID safer, but it, but, it, but it means less people are involved in some of those operations. We think the resource market has changed too. Um, People might not want to return to the rigidity of a fixed shift and contracts as were, and maybe having spent nine months working from home or on furlough, they're now beginning to think a bit more about work-life work balance and will perhaps look more favourably at a more flexible uh, working model. Well, that's great for them uh, if they can afford to do that, but it's, but it's not great for, um, for airlines and airports that are looking to have to rehire many people back at some point in the future. Now, you know, we've talked about um, uh, how, how we might recover from this. You know, we've seen some airports doing airfield equipment sharing uh, and in terminals, but there's a bit around, well, why can't we share people too? Many of the roles are repetitive and have similar skill requirements. You know, do they even need to be directly, uh, directly employed? You know, why can't skilled people provide their services to anyone who wants it in a flexible fashion? Um, one of the challenges of that, obviously, is that you need to have the right tools to basically in, right, to onboard people, to allocate them to different tasks, to ensure that they've got regulatory uh, and the training needs are satisfied, uh, and to ensure that they actually have the ability to carry out the tasks being put forward to them. And the companies are also going to need to have confidence that resource levels will be met and that um, they'll be able to meet their service levels. Um, so we need to create, you know, there's, there needs to be a tool, a set of tools that, that create a new collaboration model across physical and, and, and virtual uh, hybrid teams. Um, there was a, a point made by um, someone around, how can you get top-down 
um, buy-in for this. One of the problems we see with IT is it's often written by engineers for engineers and you give it to a, uh, to a, a C-level exec and they just look at this and go, I don't really understand this. And we need to focus on how we can make sure the right people see the right data, which is relevant to running the operation. Um, you know, to summarize, I think we, we know that companies will still need a core level of staff in the future, which are directly employed, but we'll start to see, and we think we'll start to see more sharing and more automation uh, around the allocation of assets. And we think that become commonplace as well as remote working and not just back office remote working, but operational. We touched on an APOC and why have a massive OPA, uh, an APOC why don't we have a virtual one? Um, and then uh, that touches a little bit on the environmental impact and reducing CO2. Um, and it will also allow people or companies to hire the best resources for wherever they may be. And, uh, and to give us flexibility that uh, uh, for whatever the future throws at the, the industry for the next 12 months, which is tough. And these challenges don't just apply to, to, to the air side environment, land side operations, retail, terminal, all, are all uh, applicable. Nice. Thanks, Leah. I guess there's one interesting question from Wahid that goes into your direction as well. We are talking about innovations that are a must for airlines, uh, and I would extend it to airports as well. What concrete innovations do airlines need to survive or come out stronger than before? Uh, digitization, what and where, and probably also how quickly? Lee? <laughs> Lee, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, I lost you for a second there. Could you repeat that, please? Yes, so the question from Wahid. Um, we are talking about innovations that are a must for airlines. Uh, what concrete innovations do airlines need to survive or come out stronger than before? Uh, and that's a really interesting question because actually airlines are, are part of an ecosystem of, of multiple operators. You know, they outsource a lot of their operations now to people that handle the desks, people that handle the bags, people that work out on the airfield. So, so one of the things that you traditionally see in IT is a very siloed model. And we have to have something which, which enables everyone to work in a, in a super seamless way. Um, and I think that is something that, that doesn't really exist well today, I think. Um, you can still see people walking around with clipboards on the apron and in terminals. Um, and I think if, if, if parties can't do that, then, then the new operating models are not going to work very slickly. All right, Jan William, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, not from my side. Thanks. All right, there is one question for you. So how quickly innovation will have to come in order to mitigate the problems that we have uh, due to pandemic? What do you think? That's a good question. And I think it goes back to, to, to the points that were raised earlier also by, by Daniel yep. and by some, some of our other panelists. I guess the, the best point would have been in June, July this year, because we are all aware that you need to, to kind of plan a project, there is procurement uh, included, uh, contract management and so on, then, the, then you have implementation periods. What I wanna say is that this time is already gone. Like airports and airlines missed a, a, a very, very uh, good opportunity to really lay down the foundation for the future. And that also brings me to my question. It's ASAP. Um, again, we are not speaking about uh, an airport getting in touch with any of, uh, with any kind of IT supplier or in general supplier to improve their operations and then signing an agreement tomorrow and spending $2 million by, uh, by next week. We are talking about having the next two to three to four to five months, uh, probably even the next year, discussing project management and so on and so forth. So it's not that we are talking about money that needs to be spent right now. The problem is that most of these companies have budgeting cycles that simply don't allow for quick decision making in that in that area. Right, absolutely. Okay, so we're jumping into the Q and A session. Mm -hmm. Just... All right, so we we got super interesting questions here uh, yep. Rebecca we will definitely or we will come back to all of them Rebecca sustainability I guess we all have 
an idea that this will not be forgotten. Uh, we will come back to this uh, in a moment. Veles question? Yes, Veles okay. left the Rio. Was the um, normal of December 20, uh, 2019 a good example to look forward to? If we see airports closing runways after 2021 for rehabilitation work while they did nothing during the pandemic, is there any hope for IT innovation? Anyone? Yeah, um, I, I will take this one. Thank you, Velis, for the question. That, that's a good one. Um, and I can give a few personal insights on that because I was involved in a project being airside at two major airports this summer. And it's true that it is an opportunity to do stuff that we cannot do normally. And there have been a few people and a few organizations grasping that opportunity. For example, I've seen a lot of airports or ATC organizations doing things like flight calibration. So, you know, the tests flying an aircraft to check that the signals guiding airplane are still what they are supposed to be. Normally, it's something we do at night because we don't want to waste capacity over the day. And now during the pandemic, because the traffic was so low, some ATC organizations started doing that during the day. That's really a quick win and that's easy to do. Now, your example is a bit of the other direction. Resurfacing a runway or doing rehabilitation work is not something that you can organize in a snap. I mean, you need to find a company able to do that in, the, in a relatively short time frame. And, and there are two things here. First, especially at the beginning of the crisis, it was really hard to know how long it would last for. My personal guess in March, you can, you can laugh on that, was that it would be six weeks of mask for everybody and then it was done. I'm, I'm not good at predictions, as you can see. Um, so it would be really hard to say, okay, we now close a runway for, let's say, 60 days for resurfacing without knowing when the crisis would end. And the other thing is the reaction of many airports and, and all other big organizations was to do uh, furlough or, or reduced working time, which are models in which uh, you send your staff members home and the state takes over for part of the cost. Uh, which means you cannot bring them back as, as soon as you want. It's really something that is also regulated and lasts for, for a while. And I was once looking during that summer for a big space to hold a meeting with 30 plus people at a big airport with a closed terminal. And my first reaction was, okay, easy. We have a closed terminal. We can get the waiting hall here. We can get check-in or whatever. But the point is a closed terminal in that case means uh, they shut down power they switched off water. So there was no way we could have running lavatories or even light within the terminal. So these organizations, when they start to reduce their, their working time or everything, it's not something you can just restart and not like open the terminal for me for two hours, please, I have, I have a need for, for a space. So, so these are still large organizations. Even if our project was, let's say, medium size, we could not have priority and use whatever resources we wanted. So we got some hurdles just because the organization was slowing down, like less people at the checking point for security, uh, some services being closed. And this was the first reaction. And because the time was unknown, it was not giving us more flexibility or more capacity. So I would not blame any airport for not doing something during that slot of opportunity. Now it's true that IT is much more like a place where you can seize the opportunity. And as Jan Willem said, there is an opportunity now to prepare the future and, and get more flexibility and get more innovation done. Uh, but it's still hard to manage because of that uncertainty. Perfect. Thanks. Great point, Vincent. Just one brief thing. Uh, Natalie, about the innovation as um, Vincent just touched it. So what innovation could be crucial for uh, survival of uh, aviation companies what do you think just briefly brief question sure sure um i think anything that uh will offer small small gains small wins on every single action um i hosted a webinar a couple of weeks ago um covering different roles and roles in aviation from unions to pilots to um management and safety and anything that can save twenty dollars right like we're at a crucial point where a CFO is signing off on very small amounts of money. And so even saving 100, 
hundred dollars, a hundred euros, a hundred pounds every single time that a flight happens will be crucial to the survival of all of these companies and being smarter about how they interact with um, every touch point along the way so that they can save. They know that they're doing everything that they can to survive and also that they're um, helping their the organizations that they've also invested in, like the terminals, like um, on all the shared software that they have. Cool, thanks. And I think that's something, yeah, I, I think that's something that could start immediately though. I, I realize that some, there has been some skepticism about what sort of innovation has actually been going on, but in my experience, there have been people that are staples throughout an organization and they tend to, they're not always available, but they tend to pop up and they are carrying that torch for 2021 and getting ready for the future because they know that their organization is going to survive and it'll survive with really smart um, number crunching, with really with using data and becoming smarter and sharper and beating out everyone on every single action. Um, and so I think there's, a, they, yeah, there, there is a lot of skepticism and this is definitely a, a dark year for a lot of us, especially in sales. But um, I think I think it's the mother of innovation. And if we look at the pandemic historically, um, what the Renaissance was preceded by a plague, right? And we're going to come out of this better with better portraits. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. <Kidding>. Jan Willing. <laughs> there is a question for Andreas, right? Could you please? Yes. Uh, and and looking at the time um, for the panelists, can you please, uh, like, uh, in order to get um, as many question answered as possible. Let's let's have a, a quick round of, of answers. I'd like to uh, start with Jan Brun's uh, question. So in my opinion, the integration of test results, vaccinations or similar data in the operational process would be one of the key success, success factors in the reboot. With a hopefully increasing traffic, this integration should be seamless as possible and should come quickly as possible. Does someone have a solution for this issue? Um, yes. And I will try to make it very quick. Um, actually, airports are currently really looking into that process and therefore that, that question is, is very valid. Uh, and yes, there are solutions out there, but I think it's not um, that question if there are solutions to digitalize that um, process of testing, uh, vaccination and the verification actually at an airport. It is more about also how that process will look like in the future. When I am able as a passenger actually to somehow upload my results or my, my, my uh, health status actually, because that's what uh, is, will be asked in, in, in the future. Or am I still able to do that on site uh, at the airport? Um, and in the end, this will be a decision also by the regulator. So um, governmental bodies, they will take over that decision, how things have to run. And then airports must be able to integrate actually those processes um, rather than looking for solutions. I think they would need integration partners at this end to be able that uh, a passenger is always able to, to verify the results that he got uh, as part of his journey. Just to yeah. give it a quick one. Thank you so much, Andreas. All right. Um, then there's another, another one. Um, and I guess, uh, Vincent, you, you wanted to, to also say something to this, but I would like to give a little bit of a, of a feedback to Yazenka Rapajic, or Rapajic, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, from a technology perspective, the focus is on optimizing individual functioning of airports, airlines, and ATC. What is missing is collaboration at top, level uh, at top industry levels. To make investments, CEOs and shareholders must understand the pain points from wider perspective. Some kind of visual mapping can be beneficial to initiate actions that benefits all, and in the end, the passengers. How do you see the role of technology in providing such insights? Yazenka, I think that's, that's really a, a, a core question. And um, knowing your background, I, I, I also thank you for this question. Um, in my opinion, Technology will be a driver that needs to be thought on a wider or on, on a bigger picture indeed. To make it very brief, on our side, we, we had discussions with authorities and with, with institutions such as Eurocontrol, where we say in order to really make our technology, for example, at ASIA beneficial to the industry, the more airports we cover, the better data we can deliver 
for euro control for example to manage the air transport manage uh, the, the 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 air traffic uh, flow so that means that if if we could have something on a higher level where euro control or in the us the relevant um, authority says we need these kind of technologies not only ours but but all the different technologies on a larger level that will actually as you as you already mentioned to some extent that will really drive uh, value and, and and drive innovation but vincent you also wanted to quickly say something there yeah thank you Gazenka, for the question because it's it's a really interesting one i don't think there is so much of a lack of understanding but the reason is uh, there is still a massive difference of business models between ATC and airports. Remember that airports are basically paid per passenger they process through the terminal, plus the parking fees and so on, while ATC is paid per flight. And even today, I've seen a notification from Avinor saying they had something like 80% less passengers and 60% less flights. And this makes a big difference. When you look at initiatives like uh, airports, collaborative decision-making, ACDM, we had airlines, airports, and ATC working much closer together, so it's possible. But I think as long as the business models will be so different, it will create different interests, and it's not uh, a way that will, that will support collaboration. But I really think executive levels of all organizations know the pain point of the other already quite well. All right. There is a question from Chinab. Is there any, any chance of innovation in Indian aviation industry? Andreas, uh, would you like to answer this question briefly? No, definitely not. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, for sure, I think every, every, every country or yeah, every airport has, has the, the, the drive to make things better. Yeah? I think that this is the, mo the motivator for all of us to innovate is, is that we want to continuously improve. And what I've seen actually from the Indian aviation industry is that there are some examples like Bangalore Airport that already started years ago uh, with uh, data as a brick, yeah, and initiatives to look at data and, and call collaboration um, and already started that drive forward um, to, let's say, innovate and, and make uh, their airports more digitalized. I'm, I'm pretty sure the Indian market has their challenges as well as the German and, and other countries as well. So, and, and we, we need to continuously work actually on those. Um, and I think right now we have a, a chance to, to do some of these uh, significant changes. Thank you so much, Andreas. So we are approaching the end of our virtual panel discussion. Here you can see the contacts uh, uh, of our attendee of our panelists please reach out if you have any questions uh, so to wrap it up we'd like to briefly uh, provide a personal outlook for one to five years from each of our panelists uh, for the future of aviation how it will be rebooted what are the implications uh, so please so let's keep it short to two three sentences and and sorry just just yep. as a as a quick uh, thing before so we, we we have all your questions um for the ones that we were unfortunately not able to answer Mm -hmm. um, we will definitely reach out to you um, and, 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 and answer them uh, because uh, they were also so good. So we don't want to waste any of them. So thanks a lot. Absolutely. For, thanks a lot for this. Thank you so much. Jan there is also a poll, final poll running. So please answer three questions. Uh, it's pretty short about the quality of the virtual panel discussion. And please, uh, let's start with Andreas on the personal outlook. So first of all, I'm, I'm, I still have, yeah, let's say, hope for next year, looking into the, the, the short term. Yeah, that's uh, we've run through the, let's say, the, the really that's deep um, bounds uh, of that crisis and, and can look forward now to some extent to a recovery. I think as a, as a let's say, general topic, uh, and we've mentioned before a bit that sustainability issue will still play a significant part. I think minds have not changed here even due to the pandemic. So airports and passengers actually will request that uh, to uh, have a more sustainable aviation industry in the future. And the other thing is that I, I believe personally um, that um, yeah we will have to diversify more. Suppliers, airports, airlines, okay, might be in a bit tricky uh, situation here, but uh, looking into different um, transportation modes, airports looking into how they can make their business more resilient 
or less dependent from passenger volumes, I think there will be a lot of movements around that uh, kind of diversification. Thank you so much, Andres. Uh, thank you for your input, Rico. What about you? What's your outlook? Yeah, keeping it very short, uh, I think I've, I've seen uh, several uh, crises uh, over my uh, career uh, uh, in aviation, starting with 9-11. Um, uh, and I think yeah, uh, aviation has always bounced back uh, heavier than before. And I think uh, we, we will go out, come out of this stronger. Uh, and uh, with collaboration, we're going to make that uh, uh, happen uh, and, and really get back to on, on track and uh, be much stronger than the whole industry was before. Thanks a lot for, for joining everybody. Thank you so much, Rico. Lee, what about you? What's your outlook? Uh, yeah, uh, really positive. I think those companies that adopt um, different ways of working uh, will come out of all of this uh, stronger than, than, than they entered it. Um, I think the general consensus is we're two or three years away from getting back to the, the traffic numbers that we had in 2019. So uh, we've got an opportunity there to um, use that. And thanks for joining and uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Lee. Natalie, please. Um, sure. So I think uh, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the improvements in the industry for sustainability. I think for a long time, this has been weighing on companies and we finally have some of the focus and also the regulation and pushing to start to develop that into something that isn't just far off in 2050, but that we might actually be able to reap the rewards of in five to 10 years. Um, and that's that's the kind of discussion that I've been hearing and, and the, sort of, um, the sort of writing that I produce for companies about how to explore that. I'm, I'm personally very positive about um, 2021. I think we're going to, we're going to see that there will be more focus on some things that people were pushing off three or four years and that we'll be able to execute them now. I think overall though, uh, some of the questions that were brought up, especially about bringing um, all of these different technologies together across both systems will become ultimately a, a saving grace. And that I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with Reboot Aviation to describe and also to facilitate some of those connections. And hopefully we'll be able to see those things even faster. Yes, Thanks for coming absolutely. today. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Natalie, for your contribution. Jan Willem, what's your outlook? Yeah, I think making it very quickly, um, coming back to also the question from, uh, from Rebecca, sustainability will continue to play a role also in the recovery. Um, it's not off the table. Um, and also 2020 for me was definitely a difficult year for, for the aviation industry, but it also was the foundation. Daniel, yes, we haven't seen any proper investment probably on a wider scale, but I think it was a, a turning point for the next five to 10 years to come. Uh, and, and I'm also looking to, to the next year, to the next two years, very positive, especially knowing that we are now having vaccines. Thanks everyone for joining. It was really a pleasure and, and I hope we, we shared something that is valuable. Thank you so much, Jan Willem. Vincent? Yep, uh, 2021, we certainly have a lot of hard work in front of us to do. Um, it will be the year of the recovery. Now that we have vaccines, probably the uncertainty will uh, get lower and we can start better planning the next, next steps. But I'm very positive that in, let's say, two to five years from now, aviation will be stronger as before, a bit different, and definitely rebooted. So thank you for having me today. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending, uh, for your participation, for your questions. We will get back to the questions that we didn't answer live uh, via email. Happy holidays. It was a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so Absolutely. much, everyone.